This is a very important meeting for both the Hazards Group and um, Bristol Radical History Group. It's on a very, very important topic, the topic of the blacklisting of trade union members, the illegal blacklisting of trade union members for health and safety and organising activities. And all of, a lot of us are very privileged, those of us who work in the public sector, we've managed to avoid blacklisting, certainly for the last 40-odd years, Maybe it was a problem before then, but um, for the last 40 years or so, we've been relatively protected. However, our comrades and our fellow workers in other industries um, haven't been so well protected and have suffered uh, quite considerable uh, loss of work, loss of income, loss of jobs, family breakup, etc., etc. I'd like to introduce Di Parkin, who I'm sure most of you uh, in the Bristol History Group, uh, Radical History Group, no. Um, Di is a historian, and she published the book just here, 60 Years of Struggle, The History of Betters Hanger, A Militant Kent Pitt. I probably pronounced that completely Bet's wrong. Betts Hanger. Yeah. She'll be speaking about the actions of the Economic League who provided blacklisting information to employers in the 1970s and the impact this had on militants in places such as the Cowley Car Works and the Kent Coalfield. So without any further delay, I'll introduce you to Di. Thanks very much, Pete. Um, in this talk, I'm going to give an overview uh, of blacklisting in the 20th century, but I'm not going to talk much about the Consulting Association because Andrew is going to talk about that later. So blacklisting is the organised and deliberate exclusion of workers from employment on the basis of allegations about their political views and activities, uh, their trade union representation or their work on issues of workplace safety. It's not an isolated phenomenon. It's one of the boss class's bag of dirty tricks which, which ruin workers' lives. Uh, and it goes along with corporate and police spies and infiltration of left groups, militant workplaces and of the environmental movement. And I'd like just to refer to a really excellent recent book by... Evelyn Lovers, which I believe is on our bookstore, called Secret Manoeuvres in the Dark, which is about the corporate spying uh, aspect of the actions of the, of the right. So blacklisting is a form of McCarthyism. It's a practice of making accusations of subversion with the aim of restricting dissent. My father-in-law was a chrome plater. He was in the AUW in Dundee, initially at National Cash Registers and then at Timex. He, along with 770 other stewards at NCR, were singled out in the first wave of redundancies. Later, at Timex, where he was also a student, steward, the same thing happened again, and he never worked again. He would sit in the house, age 55, and say, I'd just like a wee job, just a wee job, but no job ever came. So going back to the history, and, and I'm sure blacklisting would have existed before the 20th century, but I don't know about it before then. Uh, after the defeat of the general strike, militant miners were often dis dismissed and not able to get other work. Somebody I interviewed in my miners' book said of her father, he couldn't get a, a job in the Fife coal field because he was blacklisted for refusing to work when he was owned, owed 12 and sixpence for a shift. And another one said, they took down this file, the black book, and they said, no work for you here, all around the Bolton area. But this book didn't exist in the Kent coalfield, so particularly militant miners walked and cycled and made their way to Betsinger, which opened in 1927. And that was one of the reasons why it was a very militant pit. But it isn't only in traditional manual work that blacklisting operates. And I'm interested, you said there wasn't blacklisting in the public sector. Certainly there isn't the systematic blacklisting. But in the mid-1980s, I applied for a job with Oxford City Council. Uh, and I was later told that councillors, Labour councillors, lobbied the chair of personnel. Don't appoint her, they said, because I had a history of radicalism uh, in, the, in the town. And I've known that happen in local government at other times. But if they don't know you, they rather do need a book so they can let other employers know who the militants or the radicals are. So this is where the Economic League and the organisations that followed it come in. They are the holders of the dirty black book. 
According to Mike Hughes, whose uh, book on the history of the Economic League, whose name I'll find in a moment, uh, it was set up, given that name, uh, in 1926, and, and it worked to set up an organisation to counter what they called subversion in industry. And not only did they pass on to local employers the names of the trade unionists, they also established a formal relationship with Scotland Yard and the other agents of, of the state, with MI5 and so on. So they were strongly active in the 1920s and 30s and interested in targeting Bolshevism or people they suspected of potential sympathy to it. For example, the National Unemployed Workers Movement of the Jarrow March fame. But after the Second World War, uh, in the Cold War, with its obsession with an enemy within, meant that on both sides of the Atlantic, fantastic resources were ploughed into the surveillance of the labour movement. As with McCarthyism in America, the Atlee Labour government, excuse me, keeping on mentioning the role of the Labour Party, uh, introduced a loyalty programme and 17,000 civil servants were vetted and 150 were suspended for communist sympathies. My uncle had been a Communist Party member in the 1930s and he was removed from his job in Rolls-Royce working on the Blue Streak ballistic missile in the 1950s. In the 1950s, the Economic League continued its, what it called, its crusade for capitalism on the shop floor and outside the factory gates and operated its blacklist. It produced a magazine for managers to give an account of current subversive activities uh, when, in the mid-70s, it said the activities of Trotsky, what they called Trotskyites increased. You can always tell what side of the political fence somebody's on. If somebody talks about a Trotskyite, they don't like them. If somebody calls himself a Trotskyist, so it's a very, it's a very clear, a bit like how the special branch always have very polished shoes on. I'm going to look under the table, see anybody got into one of these dividing things. Um, anyway, uh, the magazine had, in 1977, had a circulation of 113,750, and the Economic League's income in 1968 was 266,000. And 154 firms contributed uh, 61,000 of that. And of these, at that time, it was engineering companies more than, than the construction. 47 were engineering com companies, and others covered the whole spectrum of, of ma ma manufacturing and financial interests. But by 1968, 21 banks and finance companies contributed as much as the engineers. And I think the role of the banks is really interesting. I remember visiting a, a, a bank manager in the 1970s in a forlorn uh, hope of getting an overdraft and reading, sat across the table from him, and he had these cards in front of him, proper cards, you know, there's no computers then, and I could read upside down the card and it said Workers' Socialist League, and then there was another card that said Grunwick Strike Committee. So he had flagged up from my account who I was paying money to. And it's pretty obvious that actually, and I think a lot we are all terribly naive, that they have a lot of information about what you're doing by looking at your bank account. But in 1961, the Daily Express readers were told uh, that uh, people could apply to the League, the Economic League's headquarters, conveniently opposite Buckingham Palace, to check if a prospective employee is listed, is listed as a communist sympathiser. And in 1970, the magazine Build, Building Design made the same point. The Guardian reported a confidential memo because the Guardian started exposing the Economic League. Before engaging staff in future, a call should be made and they will require the full names, the area of living, date of birth and national insurance number of the proposed employee. If there is the slightest suggestion of any information being held against the proposed employee, you do not engage the same. It doesn't matter what kind of rubbish they've cooked up about you. If you're on the list, then, then, then the, the blacklisters won't employ you. But the, this information was often wildly inaccurate, and that's it's still true today. Um, as Maria Fife uh, explained to the Scottish Select C uh, Committee, which the, the papers of the Scottish C Select Committee, I've got an exact title uh, of uh, looking into uh, blacklisting, uh, are fascinating reading. There's a great detail about, about how it's operated. And she explained that people were on the list merely for writing a letter to a paper praising Nelson Mandela. And the Economic League targeted organisations like anti-apartheid. Anti 
Oxfam, the Child Poverty Action Group, uh, as being suspect. And really kind of what I call liberal do-good, kind of quite nicey-nicey organisations. Uh, but being supporters of those would be enough the Economic League to think that you're a suspicious person. But where did they get the names from? I think that's a really co- co- an important question. And this is where I, the kind of sinisterness comes in. Mike Hughes mentions nine things. The press, uh, uh, names extracted from radical left papers, from trade union journals and local and national newspapers. Managers and, and, and people from personnel departments, sympathetic or naive trade union and Labour Party members or officials, are sympathetic to the Economic League, that is to say. League officials operating with deep cover in the trade unions. That's the sinister one. The, the, the people, of, members of the Economic League operating inside the trade union movement. Um, names of those nominating extremist candidates in local or national elections and from contacts in the security services or police force and private detective agencies. There were, of course, other completely committed, ideologically committed informants some people here may have had the misfortune to also have known somebody called Roger Rosewell. <laughs> oh! <laughs> who, poor thing. Who, in the ni- I knew him in the 1970s. He was an aerospace shop steward and rose in the International Socialists, forerunners of the SWP, to become its full-time industrial organiser. We won't require oh, you... Oh, I was the district secretary while he was industrial organiser. Well, there you are. <laughs> He later became a Daily Mail leader writer and was the bag man for the contemptible Tory politician Lady Porter in her corrupt behaviour against tenants, council tenants in Westminster. He passed over the names of individual comrades in the International Socialists and other groups. I think it was the Economic League, but he certainly passed the names over. And he was a complete renegade and turncoat. So now I want to say something about infiltration and deep cover. In the 1920s, the Economic League sent people to work in the mines, and this practice continued. In the 1970s, in the Cowley car park plants, which were at that time uh, led by stewards, stewards sympathetic to the left, in Cowley, a woman called Mrs McGibbon organised an anti-strike movement, uh, ostensibly of car workers' wives, um, trying to destabilise the strike. Then in 1984, her husband, this same McGibbon, appeared as a worker in the Betsanger Pit, 145 miles away, a man in his 40s with no experience of mining. Nobody does that. And as the NUM branch secretary at Betsanger said, there was only one explanation. McGibbon, as he had done at Cowley, was playing a deliberate role in sabotaging the strike. And he led a back-to-work movement uh, at Betsanger. Um, Terry thought he was financed by the National Association for Freedom or Aims for Industry. It could have been the Economic League. There's no hard lines between these organisations, just as there's no firm boundary between the corporate, these corporate spies, the private infiltrators, the informers, the holders of the list, the list and the states. They all kind of they, they operate together. But at Betsanger, the whole of the NUM branch committee was sacked following the occupation of the pit, Interestingly, over a health and safety issue, uh, the managers said the pit was unsafe and they were going to close it at the end of the strike. Uh, so they went and occupied the pit to prove that to prove that the health and safety issues could have been addressed. A bit of the opposite way round, but still it was health and safety. Uh, so they were all sacked at the end of the ni- 1984 miners' strike, uh, and they were they never again worked in proper jobs uh, in the United Kingdom. They were refused jobs. Digging the Channel Tunnel, it's an obvious job uh, in Kent, for which they were uniquely ex- uh, experienced. And a, a then Kent County Councillor, member of the NUM branch committee, blacklisted miner, was touring in his official council capacity, he was touring the Channel Tunnel works. Somebody said, you must apply for a job. He said, well, I don't think so. But he said, oh, no, no, you must apply. He applied, he was given a job, and he was escorted off site the next day because he was on the blacklist. <coughs> Hughes also mentions, in my list before, the collusion of trade union officials, and I think that that's something that's come to the fore very much today, isn't it? Uh, the collusion between trade union officials and construction companies. Um, 
So I'm going to just talk a bit more about the later evidence that's been connected ab about the Economic League um, through the Scottish Select Committee investigation, Maria, uh, where Maria Fife and others report some 45,000 people had records kept on them, and in 1986 alone they responded to an estimated 200 inquiries and at the time of their clo its closure, the League had files on 22,000 people. But in the 1980s, publicity and press investigations re revealed the poor quality of the League's data. And the big companies ceased giving them donations, and it was closed down in 1993. It was closed down, but somebody was saying before, it's just, you know, they just changed the name and moved around. Because the same people, um, Ian Kerr, was a founder member of the Consulting Association that Andrew's going to talk about, uh, and he came out of the Economic League. But files from the Consulting Association list people, again, similarly rubbish reasons, um, why they've got people on their lists, after being taken on, showed signs of militancy <coughs> over safety. Glasgow, pipe fitter, bad all round. Sold a socialist worker, a militant ringleader from Kilmarnock, do not touch. Glasgow is an extreme troublemaker, worse than any communist. So these are the kind of people that are on the uh, consulting association lists. Um, so one of the people uh, that I was going from the blacklist support group that you probably know was Dave Smith, and I just want to quote something that he'd said with the agency that he was working through. He was told, there's no point in you ringing us up ever again because we are never going to employ you through the agency. Because on our, on our system, you are coming up as a code 99. He saw his file, and virtually everything in it relates to raising concerns about health and safety, asbestos, toilets overflowing on building site, and a young lad falling off a third floor of scaffolding. Hardly revolutionary matters. And I think it's really interesting that we're having, it was probably designed, having this meeting today, the day after workers memorial day and of those 29 people i think in the southwest who died in the yeah, it was, yeah it was 16 this time but oh, 29 well, a couple of years back how many of them would have died uh, if there had been people who had been prepared to be uh, raise health and safety issues in their workplace that there there's a direct relationship between the the cowing of people and the blacklisting of people so they don't want to raise health and safety issue and and these people's deaths so we can see that Robert McAlpine and the construction industry, I mean, he was the one of the founder members of the Consulting Association, have been at the heart of the, last, the latest wave uh, of blacklisting. Um, building workers have been particularly targeted, and it's, it's not completely clear to me why, and perhaps somebody might come up with an answer in the discussion, why building workers are particularly targeted. But building workers were particularly targeted in 1972, if you remember, following the... Heath Tory government's defeat by the miners, uh, the kind of ruling class were looking round for a target to get back at organised labour, and of course they went for the Shrewsbury pickets uh, that led to the appalling, unjust targeting and imprisonment of what then became the Shrewsbury too. So that there's a history of them going for building workers. <clears throat> so just thinking back at this issue about this big black book, with modern day technology we'd almost long for a big black book because if it's a big black book there's only one place you're better off than you are today uh but actually um and also maybe you were even better off when there was just an economic league or consulting association because today there's whole loads of different organizations which engage in blacklisting practices the despicable g4s for example who talks about being specialists in employment screening to advise clients on their exposure to extremists and protest activity, or another new organisation which is called HR Blacklist, and I clicked onto its website yesterday, uh, and I found various people whom it describes as a communist or trade union activist. It's kind of they kind of they have no shame uh, about what, what what they're doing. Oh, I'm lost my final pages now. So I think one of the things that um, we need to discuss later on is what are the answers. Um, by 1999, people thought things were really finally settled because there was a clause in an employment bill to make blacklisting illegal. 
But that didn't come in, the regulations to enact that didn't come in place till 2010. And in the two or three years since they've been introduced, as far as I know, none of these regulations have been invoked. So it's kind of empty, completely toothless. So I would echo, echo the demands of the Blacklist Support Group for a full public apology for compensation for blacklisted workers, for no public contracts for blacklisting firms. It's outrageous that public money, is like on the Olympics or Crossrail, is spent giving money to these people who ruin workers' lives and that there should be jobs for blacklisted workers on major projects. Uh, in addition, as Evelyn, as Evelyn Lovers points out, one of the things that these big corporations really care about is their reputation. So she talks about the McLeibel case where uh, McDonald's were really bothered by the fact that people, there was negative publicity about them. So, so negative publicity and making a noise and a fuss is a really, really powerful weapon because they really, really don't like it. Um, so there's a very good um, video on the blacklisting website about the actions, uh, was it last week? Uh, the um, mm. building some big really ceremony so. in London where they're all there in their penguin suits and all the protesters outside are making a racket and a noise. So one of the things we were thinking we ought to be talking about is the firm, the blacklisting firms that must be in operation in this city uh, and whether we should be going and making a noise out of some of them. There are various lists circulating. I'm going to pass these, this one round of different firms and there's another one that somebody else has got of different firms who are involved with the consult blacklisting firms. But uh, with Evelyn Lovers, I'd conclude by saying blacklisting cannot be seen in isolation it, couldn't, it can't work without the other arm, which is the spying and information gathering, including sending inf infiltrators into organisations to identify the names of activists and take action against them. So this is not just activity against health and safety officials or trade union militants. It's also activity against environmentalists and other left, left activists, such as the McLeibel case against McDonald's, or the Mark Kennedy infiltration of the Radcliffe on Saw power station. So there's a whole kind of move by these agencies of the state and the corporate right uh, against militants across a number of fronts. Uh, and we need to be acting, it's why it's very good this meeting has happened, we need to be acting in concert to take action to, to uh, fight back against this. Thank you very much, Dice. We shall appreciate it. <laughs> I'm now going to introduce you to Andrew. He's an electrician who's worked in the construction industry for 40 years. He'll talk about his experiences of victimization and the campaign against blacklisting. He's an active member of Unite, a shop steward on a number of jobs, and is the Welsh rep of the rank and file national committee. Andrew. Oh, well, thank you for inviting me to a uh, Bristol Hazards group. Uh, when the police raided the uh, consultancy agency and lifted, uh, I think it was 3,200 files on blacklisted construction workers, they failed to notice, well they did know it was there, but apparently there were thousands upon thousands of files of other workers from other industries, but they only went there to get construction workers' files. That's all they took, everything else got left behind to be destroyed. So the 3,200 is just the tip of the iceberg as far as blacklisting goes. Um, 3,200 tales of misery and hardship for workers and their families. Most construction workers serve a four to five year apprenticeship and then for speaking up for yourself or for your fellow workers on a job, you, you could find yourself no longer to be allowed to ply, ply the trade that you've, you've learnt. Everyone in construction is affected by blacklisting because of the blacklisting, people are uh, very wary of taking on the shop, shop steward's job, even speaking up for, for basic rights. So it affects everyone. Um, and due to the nature of construction, you, you could, your, your contract could last for two weeks. You could be on a major project for two years. But guys are sort of fighting for jobs. And, you know, we've got what you call the brown noses and... Uh, the creeps 
and you know they're after your job and, and if you start speaking up or speaking up a term as far as the bosses are concerned you know you're, you're a troublemaker uh, most construction guys these days are, get taken on by uh, agencies it's what the government wants is what they're, they're flexible workforce you can get phoned up and you can get offered one day's work and that's it uh, you get no no notice of termination of your contract they can just say there's no work tomorrow don't bother coming in but we might ring you next week you get no holiday no statutory holiday pay no bank holiday pay um, and and we feel that by employing through agencies it's another form of the blacklist because once the agency the agencies are told who not to employ you, you can't get direct employment anymore from these companies. You're forced to go through these agencies. On what I would call as well a bogus self-employment, which is a massive tax fiddle. Um, so the, these these are the type of things we're up against on the construction sites. Uh, you know, raising health and safety issues like I just mentioned. You know, asbestos, toilet facilities. You you mention any of them, and you're a troublemaker. I've been a shop steward on a couple of jobs, a reluctant shop steward, I call it, because no one else would take on the job. I was a, <clears throat> a shop steward when they built the Millennium Stadium in Cardiff, and I think we had about 400 electricians on that job. We didn't lose one day's work through industrial action. We took on the employers because they were trying to, um, they didn't want to pay our uh, expenses and they were trying to undercut the rate. But just the threat, we just had a few canteen meetings and uh, sit-ins for a couple of hours and they, they soon folded. But because, because of that, I, got, I was known as a troublemaker. And then the next uh, major project in Cardiff, which was uh, the St David's 2 shopping centre, I know my friend was in the office when my application form was just thrown into the bin because he's a troublemaker. Um, like I said, you can get... You can go on the blacklist for anything, you know, uh, your partner's in the Communist Party, you've attended political meetings, it's, you know, silly. Um, I'm not actually on, I wasn't actually on the uh, consultancy agency's blacklist, and um, I was a bit disappointed with that, to be honest. <laughs> not trouble enough. Yeah, um, yeah, well, it's good. I mean, you can be forced, like I said, I couldn't get work locally sometimes, so I'd, I'd have to go and work away. A lot of contracting guys uh, like working away from home, but I got a, had a young family at the time and I didn't want to work away. I didn't see why I should have to uh, when there was plenty of work in, in my neighbourhood. Um. Anyway, um, about two years ago, the uh, the head com the major seven companies of uh, electrical mechanical uh, construction decided that they wanted to dilute uh, our skills as uh, electricians and pipe fitters. They thought, you don't need to be an electrician or a pipe fitter, you can do both. And they wanted to uh, impose uh, the, the new apprenticeships were going to be multi-skilled apprenticeships and most of the work was going to be done by labourers. You'd have uh, one electrician or pipe fitter in charge of ten labourers and, and you'd be expected to show them how to do, how to apply your trade that you served a four or five year apprenticeship for. Uh, <clears throat> and they also wanted to give us all big pay cuts. Well, the one thing that this did was uh, due to Facebook, we all got together and someone called a meeting in London and um, 500 electricians and pipe fitters turned up for that meeting and it was really uh, encouraging to see. You know, I thought I was the only one complaining about it, but then. I met the guys from Glasgow and Edinburgh and London and all, all over the UK. And out of that, we formed a rank and file committee and we decided to take on these uh, companies, which we did, you know, on the few organised sites that we had, the guys went on strike or days of action. Uh, Unite eventually came to our aid. We had to get dragged in a bit, to be honest. But when they did come, they, they brought in what they called the leverage campaign, which we found uh, was very effective. And that, that campaign is what they're about to bring in now 
for our uh, fight against the blacklist. Uh, in London, there's a guy called Frank Morris. He's an electrician. He's working on the Crossrail project, which is a £15 billion pound five-year project. I think once this is up and running, it'll be the biggest construction project in the West, Western Europe. And it's a new tunnel, a new underground that goes from Paddington right away under London to Ke- comes out in Kent and links up with 15 new existing and uh, brand new stations. So it's a massive job. Uh, Frank is an electrician. He managed to get a start at the very, on the job at the very start of it when they're just doing the tunnel in. And he was one of the electricians that, you know, that fixes the electrics be- as the tunnel's being built. Anyway, for his own protection, he decided that he, he needed to be shop steward because he'd already been kicked off the Olympic Games sites and I think he was on the blacklist. Anyway, uh, Frank and the, the, the guys elected safety steward uh, pointed out, they were working on the underground, don't forget, that there was a 11,000 volt, a live 11,000 volt cable running, running along the ground, which no one was really, they could see this cable there, but I suppose people just thought it was, it was dead because there was scaffolding piled on it, and people would just sort of step over it, you know, as though it was a piece of scrap metal. And uh, so they, they highlighted that to the um, company, who didn't like being told about it. And, and when uh, Frank's manager turned up, uh, took a photograph of it, he was escorted off-site. And the other serious health and safety issue that they um, raised was that uh, on the t- tunneling machine, you can imagine that uh, sometimes they hit pockets of gas, and so they need. There's a carriage behind the machine, which is um, a safety uh, carriage for for the guys to go to go in. Anyway, um, there was up to twenty seven to thirty guys working on the face at any time, but this carriage only had um, masks uh, for twenty people, so the se- seven people were going to get gassed. So that, you know, they, they raised that issue, which they obviously thought was uh, very serious. And as a result of that, um, Frank got moved away from the rest of the workforce. He got cabined up. In other words, he was just working in a porter cabin, making up extension leads. He wasn't allowed any contact with the rest of the workers. Uh, the safety rep got um, suspended, sent home, for, for I think it was uh, eight weeks. And then... <clears throat> The main contractors, sorry, on, on this site for Crossrail are called uh, BFK, and it's a consortium of three companies, BAM, uh, Ferrovial, and Kia. Anyway, they decided that uh, the best thing to do would be to get rid of Frank and, and the safety rep. But what, what they did uh, was rather than just sack those two, they got rid of the old uh, electrical contracting firm <coughs> called EIS. They just told them their contracting was, uh, well, they were no longer needed there. So ultimately, uh, 29 electricians got sacked off the job. Um, Frank has been outside uh, Crossrails. Uh, one, they've got projects all over London, if you can imagine, this network is being built. But Frank has picketed for the last five to six months, a lot of the time on his own, outside the, outside the job. And uh, every now and again, we have a, a phone call or a message on the internet saying that we're going to have a flash mob demonstration. And as many of us from wherever tried to turn up, and we managed to sh- shut down Oxford Street for an hour or two by pulling banners across the road and that, that type of thing. Just as soon as the traffic lights go red, we're across the road with the banners and barriers, and we shut it off for as long as the sort of police will let us. Um, like I say, now Unite have uh, decided to get behind Frank and they are now going to um, mount the leverage campaign against uh, ba- uh, B- BFK, BAM for Ovial Kia. And they've decided that um, Kia is the weakest of the three companies, so they're trying to target Kia. Now, whatever Kia are, Unite and the rank and file are going to be. Uh, last week in London, there were two awards. Uh, I think one was the housing, the housing awards, 
the, bu the builders are what I think, which Kia with a sponsor and the United Organising Committee, uh, the rank and file sparks and supporters in London all turned up and I think there's about a hundred of them at the mall. They managed to shut down a couple of roads for an hour or two. Uh, it's just to get as much bad publicity for these building companies as we can. On the Thursday night of the same week was the National Builders Awards in, in the Grosvenor Hotel. And there was about 150 of us there at that night and everyone had the Unite banners, the um, gazoos, is it? You know, they're making hell of a racket and um, again managed to shut down the road and um, leaflet in passers by just letting them letting them know why we were there. Uh, and now United are gonna push trying to push that uh, nationwide. I know in Cardiff they've had a couple of small demonstrations outside um, Kia's and BAM's office and this Friday coming uh, BAM Construction uh, are working on Cardiff uh, Central train station so they're open to have a, a big presence there on Friday morning. Uh, the RMT have said that they'll be there to support <coughs> us. Uh, different um, left-wing political parties will be there to support us. The Cardiff Trades Council will be there and um, and, and this is just the start of it and we're not going to stop until Frank gets reinstated till they stop using these blacklists till they stop using agencies because we've got a national working agreement and it, they're not supposed to work it they're not supposed to use agencies only as a very last resort but they, they only ever use agencies and also up and down the country and I know there's something going on in Scottish Parliament I think it's a members bill in the Welsh Assembly, they've raised it that apparently they're not going to award any more contracts to blacklisting companies. And I know a couple of uh, councils, Birmingham, Plymouth and Hull, to name three, I know there are more, they've all stated that they will not be using blacklisting contractors on public jobs. And like I say, these companies, we're picking on Kia first of all because Unite sees them as the weakest, and whereas they like to divide and rule, well, that's, that's what we're going to do. We're going to try and put as much pressure on the Kia. I think they're hosting or sponsoring the uh, Chelsea Flower Show, so we're going to have a mass demonstration. We, we, we just want to make them toxic. Like I said, if you can give these bad publicity, they don't like it up on <laughs> And that's, that's, I think that uh, covers what I have to say. Thank you. Right, we've got plenty of time for, for questions, so let's uh, start with questions. Who would like to ask the first one? Can I make some just comments? Yeah, sure. That? Just to broaden it a little bit, my name's Tom Cook, I'm a brickie. I'm 69 now, so I haven't worked for a few years. Um, you, you know, you talk about blacklist, but I went to Mid Wales and met somebody I'd worked for, just a bricklaying contractor. And uh, we was trying to look at somebody's name, and his wife, who had the computer, just went on the computer and picked all the names up of everybody that had ever worked for them, you know. And so it's not just a matter of a, a, this particular list here. There's so much information around um, for people, you know, in that way. So it, it's not, you know, it's not just, I mean, for my experience, you know, I once talked about working for somebody, and they were from Swindon, this Brick Lane contractor, the foreman who I'd worked with before said, um, oh, this bloke says every time I go on the job, you know, the, the union turns up. No, I don't think I'm probably on the blacklist or anything. I've never been involved that much. But it's just quite simple things. Mm. It's not that you have to have this great big blacklist, you know. It's the, the things, you know, going around. Uh, yeah, I'm Alex Gould from uh, the RMT union. A uh, couple of things. Uh, one on Dyer's uh, opening uh, contribution. I think you mentioned the website HR Consulting, Dyer. HR. Is that uh, no, HR no. Blacklist, it's called, sorry. Yeah, HR Blacklist, yeah. I believe, because I've had a look at it as well, um, that that is a phishing website. It's a fraud. It's not a genuine... <laughs> I know this sounds like a sort of bizarre thing, but somebody has set it up as a spoof website, 
Um, whether I know it has real people on it because I've been on it, um, but it, it's it's got real trade unions on it with some very sparse details mm. about their personal uh, stuff. But it's just stuff that's available uh, probably on their official union website or on it's all publicly available information. That's mm. what I'm saying. And uh, when they set it up in the wake of the original, there was a series of Guardian articles about 12 months ago on the back of Dave Smith's campaign and the legal case which he took at the original employment tribunal against Drake and Skull, and, or was it, uh, Carillion, sorry, against Carillion. And uh, that fishing website was set up a few weeks after. Now, I don't know who set it up, but I don't think it's a, how can I put this, it's not a real blacklisted website. It's perhaps an attempt to lure people in uh, to go and look after it. It's a very odd thing, but I've had a look at it myself, and it's not um, what it purports to be. Uh, I just wanted to mention uh, the rail industry because Di started out saying that um, the construction industry has been particularly targeted by blacklisters, and that's of course because it's pri mainly private sector mm. and has been uh, for the you know, whole of this whole of the 20th century, mainly private sector, but obviously largely funded by uh, public money uh, when it came to building council houses in the 40s and 50s and public construction projects uh, later on such as the motorway building uh, of the 60s and 70s. And uh, it's hugely profitable, uh, and that's why they were determined to smash uh, mm. trade union organisation uh, to keep the lump, and in the 1970s uh, to blacklist um, trade unionists in the construction industry and to take conspiracy uh, charges against 27 people in Shrewsbury. Uh, but I think it's spread way beyond the construction industry, mm. and you've already referred to a couple of sectors in the rail industry, of course, following privatisation in the mid-1990s, many of the same firms moved into civil engineering projects in the rail industry. So Amy, AMEC, Carillion, uh, Balfour BT, uh, they're all right the way through the rail industry, and we know that there are, uh, five, that Ian Kerr of consulting, um, what's the name of it? Associates. Associates. Consulting associates, we know that they had other files there which weren't recovered, but he's referred to a file on uh, RMT members, uh, which we've never actually been able to get hold of. But anyway, uh, I think you know where this stops is sort of uh, anyone's guess, but it obviously is related to where the profits are. Um, and the final point I just wanted to make is uh, we're in a year of anniversaries this year, 1913 was the Dublin lockout. One of the reasons why the Dublin lockout happened was because Ireland had the most blacklisted labour force in uh, the world. Uh, it had a lot of sweated industries, low level, high levels of emigration uh, historically, or at least for the previous uh, 75 years um, up leading up to the lockout. And what Larkin and Connolly set out to do was to find a form of organisation of workers that could break the endemic blacklisting in the labour market in Ireland. And so they invented specifically the tactic of the sympathetic strike, which the idea was, <coughs> because it was so easy to pick off working class leaders, trade union shop stewards and trade union organisers, that if you know, one person was sacked, and blacklisted, the entire working class in the town, whether it was Dublin or Wexford or wherever it was, would refuse to handle the goods of that particular employer. And I just think that's interesting that 100 years ago, they faced an even more pernicious and dangerous situation than we do. And they developed a specific tactic to deal with it. Uh, and it was a very successful tactic for a while uh, until the Dublin uh, bosses got together and decided that they were going to stop it. Uh, but, you know, I... I think it's worth remembering that. Mm -hmm. okay. I could tell you lots of stories about Roger Rose, or the interesting story about him is not what he did, but how he was suborned by the other side, because he was a very talented trade union organiser and political organiser, and the way they nobbled him is, is quite a story. But anyway, so I want to talk about, first of all, I brought my credentials. It's a, a page from the Economic League list for Liverpool in 1973, and my name's on it. Yeah. <laughs> well done. Uh, <laughs> no, the, the reason, the way I got this is because a friend of mine is doing the research for the Shrewsbury 24 campaign, and that's a classic case of, of fighting the blacklist and all that's happened. 
And I want to draw people's attention to the, the current state of the campaign, because they're campaigning to have all the papers released. Mm. And the reason why the government doesn't want the papers released, or one of them is, is it will reveal the name of their spies on the building sites, you know, the, who, who grasped up the show in 24 uh, and got Ricky Thomas and Des Warren um, arrested. Um, the other interesting thing is there's been a big campaign to get an online petition to get 100,000 names to get the raised in Parliament. And funnily enough, the campaign's been to loads of meetings, got thousands and thousands of people to commit. And the number of online petition seekers has hovered around the 28,000 mark a month. So the government is into, and, and they had sort of a meeting with some MPs last week, and it was, it's obvious that the government's interfering with this online petition because they don't want it raised in Parliament. So a paper form of the, of the petition is, is going around the country, which I'd like people to sign now. It'll also be available on the, the Badica uh, stall on May Day, on the May Day demonstration on Saturday, whichever everybody's going to. But it's important that we get this spread and we get this release because it's a classic case of the way they, they, that they operate. I, I mean, I've come across this sort of thing most of my working life, I've seen the way that they, they, they nobbled <coughs> the NUT of all organisations in this city in the 1980s. Um, they are utterly, utterly ruthless. And it, it's not true that the public sector's been free of it. You know, I, I've come across cases in teaching of people who've been on a blacklist, and people who've, uh, young teachers coming in for job have been on the probationary year, and not got, they've they failed it, not because they're poor teachers, just no explanation, you know. It's obvious because they were they were left wingers. Uh, uh, Martin Upchurch, um, member of the College Lecturers Union, and when they think about the public sector, I think the blacklist is more subtle. Yeah. It's done through HR departments. Yeah. They just pick up the phone and it's coded references given. Um, they don't need you know consulting agencies because you know the private sector is more like a band of warring brothers, and sometimes they don't trust what they're the phone call is, so they need some sort of neutral agency to collect information for them. But I, I, want, I want just to say something about, um, uh, uh, Alex mentioned anniversaries, and, and this year is the 50th anniversary of the Bristol bus boycott, mm -hmm. which of course is the ultimate um, form of blacklisting in, in more ways than one, on mm -hmm. the basis of the colour of your skin. And what I've, what I've been trying to do, in, and I'm with Madge Dresser, who wrote the original booklet on the Bristol bus boycott, for those that you don't know about it, up until 1963, um, you, if, you, if you were black, you couldn't get a job on the buses. There was collusion between the Bristol Omnibus Company and um, the T&G Union. Um, it's well recorded, and T&G have admitted that, so I'm not sort of saying anything I shouldn't hear. Um, and there was a, a big campaign in the city, uh, led by black people, uh, supported by students, by Tony Benn, and eventually the colour bar. Uh, was rescinded by a mass meeting of 500 TNG branch members. Um, it's the 50th anniversary, and Madge Dresser wrote a book, a historian at UWE, a few years ago. We want to get that reprinted, because it's now out of print. In fact, if you go for it on Amazon, it's over £30. There's only very few, few of them left. We want to get the book reprinted, um, have a, a trade union sponsored meeting to relaunch the book, and mm. produce um, an education pact with the aid of United Against Fascism, a funding an education pact. Uh, for schools about the boycott uh, to get the thing raised uh, again within the city and Unite for example here have, have been very helpful in, in helping with the funding and the NUT and some other organisations. I have a letter, an invitation letter here uh, if anybody would like to take the invitation letter to the trade union branch and if you sponsor the relaunch of the booklet you get an acknowledgement in the book and obviously an invite, uh, a priority invite to the trade union meeting uh, that we'll be having in the city later in the year. If you come and see me if you're interested in that. I'll be only too pleased to give you a letter. And, yeah. Yeah, uh, like Nigel, I was active uh, in uh, the ASW, the Magnetic Society of Woodworkers, in Merseyside in the 70s. And uh, it wasn't just construction workers, it was shipyard workers as well that were blacklisted. Uh, but it was a bit of a running joke with a lot of the workers at the time because, you know, we, we, it was suggested that, uh, that there were so many people on the blacklist it would be totally ineffective. But uh, it's amazing to think it's still going on. And the issue of the public sector, well, as more and more of the public sector become, pro the, become the private sector mm. and are outsourced, it's gonna become more of an issue as the, you know, as the, uh, the issues become sharper. 
uh, one of the reasons why the construction trade was picked on was that there's millions of pounds worth involved, as already been said. And if you've got key workers, if you can slow a job down, uh, and if you can't deliver on a certain date, and if you're too insistent on bonuses and not working in inclement weather, then you're likely to be on the list. And it is intimidating young, younger workers now from coming forward to take on responsibility in the trade union movement. It's up to you know, everybody really who's got experience of this to come together because, you know, I, I fear to think what the trade union future is going to be if people are going to be intimidated by their employers in, in this way. And, you know, picketing and lobbying is fine, but I think the people that we're funding, i.e. the Labour Party, owe a responsibility on, on this as well. And it's not just the, the you know, blacklisting. It's, there's a whole set of attacks now. And I think we should have, like, facility time, for example, like, you know, secret ballots. You can't actually walk off a job now, even if it's dangerous, you know, so without, without being um, contravening some trade union law. I think we need a totally new settlement for workers throughout the country. And we should take a charter to Miliband and his mates and say, look, get that enacted. And if they don't make any concessions on that, you know, we have to revisit the funding issue again. Because what are they doing? You know, they're taking the money, but they're not providing anything. There are plenty of organisations out there now who will do the fighting. So we don't need a Labour Party in the way we did before, but we should be making demands off them. You know, and not put it all on individual shop stewards. You know, we should go have a workers' charter and present it to the Labour Party, because there's a possibility they may be re-elected. Thanks. Um, a couple of things, um, to just read slightly, the, um, when I was talking to all the Trish on site, he, he was pointing out, um, he, oh boy, he was pointing out that um, often with the kind of 70, 60, 70 strikes is that the job will be we're going perfectly okay. And because it was all subcontracted and there were various snagging clauses and the exemption for strikes, as much as the job would be going perfectly okay and the manager would provoke a strike mm. so um, um, that the main contractor could say, oh, you know, snagging clause doesn't apply. Um, the, other, the other kind of thing is I think um, the building industry has always been the, the vanguard of worst practice, but almost because of the way it's organised, they've always developed some of the worst practice and it, it, it almost goes into their attitude, they're, they're the worst form of employer, the most exploitative, most unpleasant, who develop the worst employment practices, which are then parceled off into other industries. It's almost attitudinal. And because it's subcontracted so many times, everybody's trying to chisel each other, if you know what I mean. Just a warning, there are health and safety reps around the room. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be signed in pen, is what you're saying. You know, I've been working at Airbus for the last 20 odd years, I'm currently doing agency work for the last years, but I just wanted to point out something about, about vetting, which seems to have changed. When I first started working up there, because there was military stuff being done there, you have to sign the Official Secrets Act, and that was about it. Okay, so you sign the Official Secrets Act, and that's it. That was like 1990 or something, but now, about seven years ago, we started getting vetted like by these, you know, the quite serious vetting, um, like you know, just forms you fill out. In the old days, you, you, you'd still get the odd form came through, but it would be like you only have to declare you've got a live criminal record or something like that. So, you know, you kind of ignored that. But the ones that came through about six, seven years ago, which were government ones, were saying things like, if you do not give us every bit of information about yourself, like including whether you've been arrested, whether he's not really been convicted, whether you've got live or dead convictions, a whole lot, and a load of other stuff. And it said on the bottom, and I kid you not, I'm, you know, I was shocked at the time, it basically said, if you lie about anything, or you don't disclose information, whichever way you look at it, then you know, you're liable to be barred from working in the aerospace industry. Even more recently, there's an unbelievable one that's covered by Airbus I saw the other week, called Laugh Around the Office, but it said, it was one that you have to sign with your manager, and it says like, uh, it, you know, it says to the manager, are there any practices 
um, you know, in, in your employees that you, you know, that you might like to point out, you know, so you're, it's like a dual thing, you sign it, and then they fill out the rest of it about you. And what it said was, is what they were looking out for was extravagant lifestyles. You're right. That was apparently a sign that you were an unreliable or you could be a security risk. Also, extravagant lifestyles, uh, cultural behaviours, which might be call your, your loyalty into question. Oh, I don't know what's that like. That would be that guy stuff like that. So it, what I'm trying to say is it's going beyond the, like, you know, you, you actually are a member of the social support. Oh, you're a member of a member of the Commons Party sort of stuff. So workers now, down, they're looking at stuff like, you know, like lifestyle and stuff, which is unbelievable, because I don't remember ever seeing that before in anywhere I've worked, really. I mean, obviously, I think that's it, really. So the vetting's getting, I'm certainly up there, but I've rolled voice at work, so then it's getting much more <coughs> serious, like, and much harder to deal with. Mm. Well, just a, a comment about casualisation, that, you know, a few years, well, a few decades ago, there were some industries where casualisation was, was the norm. And you can just be chucked off the job, you can hired for a day or for a few days, like the old situation in the docks. But what's happening now, of course, is we've got a whole culture of casualisation in every industry, in every workplace, in every job, where before, you know, basically you had strong union presence and you had agreements. I mean, I, the last few years I've just been doing temp jobs. Uh, going into things like councils, going into things like um, the local mental health authority and doing jobs there. 50% of the workers in a lot of the offices are temp workers. And the last job I worked in, um, there was a woman there who was deemed to be a bit too talkative in between fielding phone calls. We were on a switchboard. She was sacked without any notice at all with a message on her answer phone when she got in that night uh, from the agency. I basically told, don't bother apply for any more jobs with us. So it's like what, what used to be this thing about blacklisting I think as the last thing says, now spread out to a situation where so much stuff goes through agencies who vet you anyway. I mean, basically, you've got one strike against you with those kind of employers and you finish with that agency. Um, it's a real job for the trade union movement and the working class to say, God, how do we actually address that? And I think just to finish the point somebody else made about young workers. Um, well, young and old, the places where I've been working where you can quietly try and do stuff, subtly do stuff so you don't get booted straight out, people are terrified, absolutely terrified that the bosses, and this is in local government, mind you, and the health service, but that the management will see that you're a troublemaker, so-called, and people don't even use the union word there, and that, that's the job we've got on, I think, to, to try and address that not even employing you. And not only that, me, me and a, we are in the same union, it's Tom, me and Tom in the same union, and there was a, one of our union branch turned up with this uh, contract he had to sign before he went on the construction site. So he was, a, he was employed by an agency and through a, a payroll company, and he had to fill out this form, didn't he, Tom? And it said, like, you, you're not allowed to bring a mobile phone on. There's a whole list of things he had to sign. So if, you, you know, if you've got a kid, you need to, you know, or you, you need to be in contact with family members. I mean, if you, they can just get rid of you for having one of these. Yeah. They've always got a way of getting rid of you. They don't, they, they don't need a reason anyway. You know, you can be sacked at day's notice anyway. But, I mean, it is pretty bad. <laughs> Yeah, and my name is Paul Chamberlain, I'm a, a journalist, I teach at University of Sweden as well, and I wrote the original story for The Guardian about the Consulting Association, oh, and I'm writing a book yes, with yes. Dave Smith about the, about the blacklist. Um, uh, they seized, uh, as you said, 3,233 files. They've only released, I think, about 250 to 300. Now, a lot of the people, as the files date back from the Economic League, are going to be dead, but there are still hundreds of files which haven't been claimed, and I wonder whether anybody here would make an application to get a file, if not, it would encourage other people to make an application for a file. One particular reason, two particular reasons really. One is that it's important that people have that information that the files revealed, but also that the support group is bringing in a legal claim against McAlpine's 
um, which should be heard in the High Court probably in February of next year. Um, uh, and Gunny Clark Ryan have, um, have hired some uh, uh, top QCs to bring a multi million pound compensation civil case, and they're looking for people to join that claim. And as part of that, you'll need to kind of show that you had a file. So there are still hundreds of people, I think, who haven't, or maybe thought it's not worth it. But I think it's worth putting the message out that it's worth asking the Information Commissioner's Office, you just need your name and a national insurance number. And I think it's worth putting that message around to say, to check, you know, have, have they got a file? And if so, think about adding your name to, to that claim. They've got about 110 people on, the, on that ticket claim at the moment. Um, and uh, it's very successful. And I'd be interested in anybody here has, 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 has received a file. And the second point is that uh, from the fact that the names that have come out so far, with some the concentration within the construction industry, uh, mainly in the northwest and London, as you'd expect. Um, but there are, as you said, about R&T on there. Um, oil industry ran a, a no, um, uh, do not return system um, for quite a long while, and they were listed on there. I spoke to journalists and academics who were on the Consulting Association file. Very, very minor, so it's not, not as much construction or DRMT, but it spreads across a number of different sectors. Um, and it's geographically pretty much much further spread as well. Indeed, um, Cabot Circus, it looked like the cow pines were employed on the building Cabot Circus were operating the blacklist at the time, and that's been constructed. And Cullen McAlpine, who was the original bag man for setting up the consulting association, he was McAlpine's son in charge of the South West and kind of set it up with the original £10,000. From what I understand, he, he's probably moved on, but Cold Ashton was where he lives, and he's got a big old pad up at Cold Ashton. Yeah, it's kind of local to us. Mm -hmm. That's which mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Just explain, Phil, how people go about making an application for information. Yeah, so the um, Information Commission's Office is the, um, the kind of organisation which um, uh, regulates um, your data, if you like. In fact, I made a complaint this morning, I've got a spam phone call from someone ringing up saying, sell the insurance or something like that. You know, they're the people that will regulate that. And they're the people that went in originally because it was a breach of the Data Protection Act and they seized, they seized the files. Um, and they did say originally that they were going to uh, destroy them after six months. But because of pressure from UCAT and others to kind of keep hold of them. In fact, now they're saying they're going to go into the National Archives eventually. And it's kind of something of a turnaround. Um, so you can ring up the Information Commissioner's office. Um, they set up original helpline, but just do it on their kind of standard number. They, they've obviously had a number of calls who aren't used to it. Give them a name and some kind of identified national insurance number. They'll go away and check. And then they'll let you know if you've got a file, and then they'll send you a copy. That may be what they call redacted. In other words, they'll kind of do a, a blank out a little bit. So it's other people's names to protect their personal information, if you like. And it's not a guarantee because there's information from some of the lawyers that have worked on civil claims um, and as well as worked for the unions bringing uh, employment tribunal claims that the ICO haven't been um, maybe as forthcoming as one might expect in terms of being able to provide a file. Nonetheless, they are the only people that have got it and that is the kind of right procedure to go and I would think that it's something worth doing to kind of say if you think then it's worth making, making guess on, uh, making, a, making a call on that, it's free. It is and they'll, they'll call or, or email back to you. And so you'll find their number on the website. That's the Office of the Information Commissioner. It's ico.gov.uk. Yeah, I've got a number here, but... <coughs> yeah. It's... Zero three zero three. One, two, three. Yeah. Travel one, three. Yeah. 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 One, 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 three. If anyone asks you where you got that number from, don't tell us. If you want the website, ico.org.uk. No bother use in front of it. <coughs> yeah, uh, I'm Paul King, I'm on the Eastfield Bank and Fall member of the uh, Commercial Road Transport the team of Queens, it was called back then, in a uh, Rank and member of the Bus Drivers Union. I'm now the uh, um, chairman for the new community branch of uh, United. Um, I don't know what, what I say really was, when I was uh, working for commercial road transport, the member of the commercial road transport, I worked for, um, I was a, a, a union member at a company, the, a, a vehicle hire company, but, you know, so like my, my recent work history is mostly like road transport passenger. And, um, uh, we managed to get quite a sort of rigid health and safety regime put in there, which is quite difficult because I was the only union member at the time and uh, I was very popular for it with the sort of companies you could well imagine. Like. Um, 
Well, I'll, I'll basically constructive, constructively cons uh, dismiss because um, uh, the boss wanted to let a vehicle go out on the road, a minibus, it was unsafe unsafe for the road, like it had an issue with the, um, the wheel basically had a screw in it and it was, um, uh, the tire was going down, like, you know, you could see this because the, we just washed the vehicle and it was wet, you could see the bubbles coming out, like, you know. Um, the, the vehicle didn't go out, thankfully, like, but I was still sort of sacked for it. Um, I mean, these vehicles were used to go to school to transport kids around to, on school trips and, you know, sort of things like that. Um, but like it, uh, it, uh, a lot of the public schools actually in Bristol, a, 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 lot, a lot of schools used by the sort of like great and good of the city, like, you know, uh, Bristol Cathedral School, um, in fact, like, you know, and I was sat next to a woman on a, out of social care course quite recently, probably just under a year ago now, and um, it, Outside of the debate here, uh, we were discussing old people, and these people had really bad, prejudiced ideals about the elderly, and I wasn't going along with this. And I got called something like by this middle class woman with a double barrel surname, or oh, you're not one of these commie, lefty, PC types, or, or, or are you like, you know? And I, you know, I, I had to point out to her that, you know, actually is a, is a, is a lefty, PC, commie type, as you say, that probably kept your child from having a fatal accident <laughs> going down the motorway when your tire was blown out, like, you know? So I think, I think the point I'm going to try, try and make is that ideologically, um, prejudice against the working class and sort of trade unionists, they're prepared to go as far as is actually harming their own children. Um, do you know what I mean? Um, uh, and from so just from some of the, the, the debate tonight, I mean, I, I, it, it, I think you know, you know, there is a, 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 a negative attitude towards sort of trade unionists, but you know, but if people sort of point out that actually we're protecting the public safety as well, not just watching our own backs and our members, but this health and safety stuff that we do actually, you know, some some real disaster like I probably mentioned with uh, our, our various esteemed guests at my right, like you know, but if, you know, if we sort of prove that we're actually trying to protect the, the public. Um, uh, uh, as well, but, you know, and, and <coughs> on top of that, can I just say that it's a pretty poor show that World Memorial Day was celebrated at Bristol Cathedral with that story in mind, like, you know? I mean, surely that our health and safety reps should be, you know, sort of toys pulled up and given sort of confidence, like, you know, without being insulted by the very establishment that we held a service at, like, you know? Um, you will be pleased to know that Bristol Hazards Group refused to go to the cathedral. Yeah, I know, I know. I think like, it's interesting. I was reading this week about how they're selling at all the like. It's, I mean, it's not directly linked to blacklisting, but it's almost like blacklisting is happening in the benefit system. If you take this this dynamic and you look at what they're doing, I mean they're basically, you know, they, they all these changes to the legal aid system. Like there's talk of G G four taking on legal aid, <laughs> which is unbelievable. I mean, but this is really, you know, this is like it's just the same thing happening in a different in an employment sector, in that people are being, you know, forced off benefits. And then the representation that they're going to, they, in order to challenge, well, lots of stuff they won't be able to challenge anyway because they won't fund it. But if they can, then they're going to be seeking assistance from these yeah. scumbags who, you know, it's like completely. Yeah. <laughs> it's unbelievable that they're, I mean, it's like they, they're completely sewing up at, at every point. You know, we get rid of the appeal, we get rid of the, um, your, your representation is going to be the people who effectively are gathering the information. And what are the, you know, these people are going to be, they're gathering the information in lots of places. So, you know, you could be, you know, blacklisted, made unemployed. Your name's on that, on that system with G4, or whatever, you know. Then, 
you're coming to claim benefits, you could be further discrim you could be discriminated from like it's like discrimination from cradle to grave, isn't it? You know, it's like <laughs> start here, do do do. You're you know, you fuck with us and we bash you down at every level. And I think, you know, maybe there is you know, the the, the unemployment you know, the way that people are being treated on, on benefits is appalling. And I don't know what is the, the, the you know, I know there's a community union type stuff, but there, there needs to be links made between the, the, this blacklisting in employment and blacklisting dynamic going on in unemployment sector, you know. I mean, particularly like for people who, potentially people who could have lost their job or something happens to them because of a health and safety issue, they then have to claim atos then reduce the, um, stop them receiving their benefits do you know what i mean it's like this whole yeah. system and i don't know how, how how that could be done with the unions but it does feel like the, it, it's, a, it's a channel you know they're just yeah. putting all these things in place they're not just loading the aces they're loading every single yeah. part <laughs> it's part unbelievable that they can get away with what, yeah. what they're doing at the moment really i mean but they are I mean, it's, I'll just check to see if there's any, any last questions. Sorry. I'll take one here. Yeah, just, just briefly, just to back up what Paul was saying actually. So I work in road transport commercial, I'm a truck driver, but I've also worked in passenger transport. And, and so, really, quite an interesting sector, really, because the old issue has been raised of, of the, the role of agencies. The place where I work now is considered. You know, the, the industry is rife with agencies, both in terms of like the indoor work, which is like order picking, warehouse work and so on, but also with driving. And you know, there have been times where I, I've worked at firms where it's considered a low proportion of agency staff if you on drivers, never mind warehouse, which is higher proportion, but it's considered a low proportion if you've got thirty percent agency drivers. And this is a a really a very amenable sort of way of, of employers disciplining the workforce, which is you know it's been raised. I don't have to repeat that really, but it's you know you, you get work allocated by the day or if you're lucky by the week, and if you don't behave, you just don't get another phone call. Simple as that, you know. And it's uh, it's, it's a very amenable, but it's also an industry which is which is under half a million vocational uh, license holders, HGV and PSV drivers. Half, that's a workforce of half a million. It's a huge sector, and that's just the, that's, you know that's 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 not the whole of it. And that doesn't take account of, of is as many if not more working inside in terms of order picking, assembling orders, loading, unloading, warehouse work, etc., etc. Huge sector, a huge sector, and it is disciplined in that kind of way in in in, in many of its aspects. And. <coughs> You know, it's one that we really got to work on, and it's it's one that historically has been reasonably well organised. But in the last few decades, that organisation—I mean, I can I can see it because I worked on the buses for '78 to '81. That, that was the militant A days of Bristol buses. That was we, you know, we were locked out for refusing to put fares up. We were we had <laughs> you know we refused to accept the fare, but they locked us out. You know, things like that. Um, but now work conditions. I mean, Paul worked on it later, later than me, and he, he also, I, I, you know, we, we can compare notes. And Jesus Christ, did the conditions d deteriorate? And I was also had a stamp on my personnel file on the National Bus Company, nationalised industry at that time, not to be reemployed. There was a blacklist working in the NBC. I can tell you because I was on it. Also before that, I was on the Economic League. I couldn't get a job in Rolls Royce Foundry in my previous incarnation of work. But so, so, you know, there are a lot of sectors affected by this, and, and the, the real point I want to make is that, that I personally draw a lot of strength from about what the Sparks have been doing and what mm. the building sector mm. have been doing. And one of the most inspiring and, and, and the, 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 the bit that fires you up is when these guys go out and stand outside of these junkets, of these big companies, mm. and bl blow them fucking horn in their ears yeah. and make them people very, very uncomfortable. Yeah. Bring us traffic to direct action gets results. Yeah. Direct action got Stuart Room back into work at Grange Bank. Steve Aitchison is another one who's been standing outside of a place for, for a long, long time and he's still there. And these people, to me, are an inspiration for this and the direct action aspect of this is something that we really, really got to build. And I'd like to see something happening in Bristol around these employers. And I'd like to see people travelling over to Cardiff. 
and doing stuff over there. Let's get out on this stuff and direct action gets results. And if we haven't learned that as trade unions, we haven't learned very much, have we? So, Is your point a fairly quick one? Yeah, it's As long as they're quick, because yeah, well, the wanna, speakers want a chance know, to respond. Somebody, somebody's already mentioned the fact that there are, I think, uh, uh, Andrew. A, a spark, uh, <laughs> sorry, yeah, Andy, yeah. said at the beginning that three, he mentioned three councils yeah. that said they won't mm. employ um, for contractors that, that, that don't give a guarantee, they don't use blacklists. I think there are seven, I might be wrong about that, I think there are seven councils that have said that. Has anyone, does anyone know whether anyone's made any demands on, I don't know, Labour Party candidates standing in Bristol next Thursday as to whether uh, the party locally, if they were uh, ever in a position to hold a, uh, a majority in, on the City Council, uh, would implement uh, the same policy? I mean, it's just a question. I don't know whether that demand's been made, but I think it ought to be raised. Good question. And I'll just also a flag up the campaign for trading and freedom, uh, which was launched a couple of weeks ago, which is supported by Unite and uh, about 20 other unions, including my own, um, which has is developing a workers' charter, which I think you were mentioning, one of the points of that is uh, a guarantee about blacklisting, and I don't know how it's been formulated, but it's included in the list of demands alongside the right to strike and the right to take sympathetic action. One, one of the things which isn't mentioned much they seem to have done it by stealth, is that your rights at employment tribunals have been reduced quite significantly as well, without very much contact from the unions. You know, bit by bit, it's taken every single right. You, 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 it's taken decades to get those rights, and they've just been critical, that really, basically. Yeah. But um, you, you, what you say is right, the local councillors should be put on the spot about, it, about this, you know, I mean, basically, that people turn the, turn away from and turn the blind eyes to this. But for, for workers, I mean, you've got to be very brave these days to be a trade unionist. And and very often, you know, it causes problems in the, with your family life and uh, and your friends. And you know, it, it's a tremendously stressful thing. It's bad enough having to go to work and put up with all the rubbish that you have at work. But when you've also got to actually leave men in dispute and negotiate with the boss and be castigated by them as well. I mean, it must be an absolute nightmare. You know, we do need something a bit more solid, you know, from, from the councillors and the Labour Party and those people who are taking, taking trade union money and not doing anything for it, essentially, you know. Yeah. Right, I'm going to ask Di first if she'd like to quickly respond. OK, um, I'm not sure what the structure of the hazard group is in terms of well, I mean, what I would like to see is this meeting, which is quite, seems to be quite a well-attended meeting, kind of passing some kind of resolution, a demands on Bristol Council uh, that, it, and we can get the wording right, that it shouldn't have contracts with these blacklisting firms. Uh, that's one thing. I also think we ought to be identifying, and I'm not quite sure how to go forward with this, but identifying which, where the nearest Keir site is and going along there with horns, if we're not going on Friday morning, and you, you perhaps you could tell the time at Cardiff Station, because it's not far, we can just get on the train, um, t to, support, to support that action. But another thing I wanted to say was, kind of in a way, like when we are gathered together on any kind of issue these days, or you meet with your mates on an issue, you kind of, and then there's this thing, and they've done this thing, and it's worse, and it's worse, and it's worse, and we're really getting utterly <coughs> depressed because of the amount of attacks uh, by this government and by the ruling class is so immense. But on the other hand, uh, the, some of the things that they're doing, and people were talking about how, about how they don't need a book and they don't need an economic league, they can just use the internet to blacklist. But we also can use the internet. I mean, I don't happen to be on Facebook, but nonetheless, what you were saying about how you can organise, we can also use some of their tools. And I think that this is... Uh, a well-attended meeting that might not have been so well-attended a few years ago, and I think that we are resisting, and we're getting more uh, imaginative in our methods of resistance. I like the way you said you got the, in Oxford Street and pulled barriers across. You know, before we'd walked along, three arrests, you know, with our little banner and be a bit feeble. And um, we're actually much more engaging, much more interesting direct action, which gets 
press coverage which they don't like. They don't like it up them. So we ought to be doing more of getting whatever it is up them to try <laughs> to, to, to resist. Oh, and also, finally, the, the, about the bus boycott. I think that's a really important thing, the, the, the racism. And it's absolutely, isn't it extraordinary that 50 years ago in this city there was a colour bar? So sometimes when you think things are really grim and dreadful, well, it's not quite as dreadful as that on that kind of front. And that was action that led that to that being overcome. So I think we need to pat ourselves on the back as well of the things that we've done that have been taking things forward. Just stop. Do you want to say anything? Oh, just quickly. Yeah, thanks again for uh, coming and listening to her and supporting the uh, blacklisted construction workers. Yeah, there is a demonstration in Cardiff General Station at um, between seven. I think it's seven till nine. Or it might go on longer. Um, that's this Saturday, and I'll get in touch with uh, our regional organizer, who is also in charge of the Bristol and the West and ask him to get some action, you know, so we can come to a town near you soon. And uh, <coughs> also I'll be in touch with Ian, I think it's called, um, on the Facebook, for those who aren't on it, it's, uh, is it the, um, what's it, the Blacklist, Blacklist Support Group, isn't it? Yeah, Blacklist you go on the Blacklist Support Group, um, it shows all the videos and things that they, they've been up to. And like I say, we will be in touch and hopefully we can get some demos going off on a couple of sites in Bristol. And also, <laughs> we got a builder's bucket. Um, if anyone's got any, could contribute to the uh, Blacklist Support Group. I think it's actually for um, Steve Aitchison, who, who's out of work for five years, and um, Frank, I can't think of the second name, no? Frank, Frank Morris, who's been out of work for six, six months on the cross rail. Uh, any donations would be gratefully received. Thank you very much. <laughs>